Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Pod- Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Experts. I'm your host, Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Myra Guerrero. She's professor of medicine, a structural interventional cardiologist here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and she leads several international clinical trials. Today, our topic is mitral valve repair and replacement in the cath lab. The future is now. Welcome, Myra. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here, and I'm so excited to share with you all the options that we have for our patients nowadays. So you're going to share with us the current transcatheter mitral interventional options, including repair or replacement. And Dr. Guerrero is going to speak to the pre and post procedure evaluation process, and importantly, when to refer patients to her. So Myra, let's just start by telling us what's available. What are the types of percutaneous transcatheter interventions for mitral stenosis and regurgitation? Thank you very much. We do have many options actually. In general, we divide them into repair or replacement. And in the repair category, there are a couple already approved by the FDA, and there are several available under clinical trials. In the replacement option, there's nothing available as approved by the FDA yet, but there are multiple ongoing pivotal clinical trials. Some of them already completed enrollment and may get approval soon. So there are many options, particularly for high surgical risk patients. So, I mean, that leads into... How do you go about determining which patients should be considered um, for repair versus replacement? And I guess that as you speak to that question, how does somebody like me sort out the patients who should see you versus not? Thank you very much. Well, in the replacement option, well, actually for both of them, is mostly driven by surgical risk. And let's talk about replacement because um, there are some patients, particularly in the replacement category, that are always or almost always high surgical risk. Those are patients who had already a prior mitral valve replacement, a surgical mitral valve replacement with a tissue valve or bioprosthesis, or patients who had a prior surgical repair with an annuloplasty ring. For those patients who need to have a repeat intervention, the risk of the second surgery is usually high. And there are already, there's an option for those patients that is actually FDA approved, Um, If the anatomy is favorable, of course, you could treat those patients with a completely transvenous transeptal procedure uh, with a mitral valvin valve or a mitral valvin ring using the commercially available transcatheter aortic uh, heart valves, which is what we use for TAVR. They can be used to treat a patient who has a failing surgical bioprosthesis or a prior surgical repair with annuloplasty ring that is no longer working. So that's great um, uh, to to hear because I think probably some of those folks aren't even getting referred because um, we may not know that this is an option. So yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say those are the ones who had prior uh, intervention. And then the other category for is for patients who have not had an intervention yet, but they have high surgical risk. Um, Those patients, if the anatomy is favorable for repair, um, the patients can be treated with a transcatheter, transvenous, transeptal repair, either with a mitral clip or a Pascal device. You know, try to approximate the two uh, anterior and posterior leaflets to decrease the amount of regurgitation. Uh, Not every patient has anatomy that is favorable to get an adequate result. Those patients can be evaluated for a transcatheter replacement option, and there are already multiple ongoing pivotal clinical trials for those patients. Great. Thank you. So once they do come to you, what is involved in the process of evaluation who's being considered for this? So we we there we they've made the initial cut, but what are the considerations that you have that helps you hone in on the best case? Well, we utilize the heart team approach. So patients uh, need to expect that they will be seen not only by interventional cardiologists, but by a cardiac surgeon as well. And um, we need to obtain advanced cardiac imaging, including a cardiac CT scan. 
Uh, and it's a special protocol. Unfortunately, we cannot just take any CT scan uh, to obtain these measurements. It's a special cardiac CT in a way similar to what uh, is done for TAVR. It gets all the cardiac cycles. So we measure the uh, mitral valve, both during systole and diastole, multiple measurements. And we, with that, we can determine what options are available to that particular patient. So usually it's a, an appointment um, or a visit, I should say, that requires multiple appointments, but they try to be condensed. We try to condense them in a short period of time, like a, you know, two or three days. So patients don't have to make multiple trips um, to, to our center for evaluation. Once we uh, obtain all the images that are needed, and if the surgeon agrees that a minimally invasive procedure with a transcatheter repair or replacement is the best option, then we can proceed uh, with the actual procedure, sometimes during the same visit. But if it is in a clinical trial, it takes a little bit of time. It may take up to two weeks for us to obtain the results of the review of the sponsor to see if they have a device that is going to uh, fit the anatomy of the patient. So we ask patients to please be patient, give us a time so that we can complete the extensive evaluation that is needed to give them the best answer possible. Once you've decided we're gonna we're gonna proceed, um, what do you tell the patients about their actual inpatient stay, both uh, you know day of uh, the procedure and then how long they're in? If it's a transeptal procedure, uh, which is just fully transvenous, you know, through the right femoral vein into the right atrium and then through the interatrial uh, septum into the left atrium, you know, that's the least invasive um, way to deliver a valve. Those patients usually, if there are no complications, they do recover very quickly. Uh, many may be already walking in the hallway the same day and um, they may be the charge the following day. I still ask patients to be mentally prepared to stay with us, you know, two to five days, just in case we need to keep them a little longer. But if there are no complications, some patients can be discharged the following day. So it's a big, you know, game changer compared with the recovery, uh, the usual recovery from a surgical mitral intervention, which it takes longer, a few days in the hospital and, you know, a few weeks of cardiac rehab. Yeah, I'm sure those who've had a prior cardiac surgical procedure are really appreciative of of the um, quick recovery. So what do you then tell the patients um, about their going home? Um, Do they qualify for cardiac rehab? What are your recommendations in the first days or weeks after they um, go home? Thank you. Yeah, the cardiac rehab, it's highly recommended for any patient who has any type of cardiac intervention. So we still would recommend that. In, in also medical treatment. And for replacement, patients may need to take a blood thinner for at least six months, although we most likely we would recommend it longer if the patient can tolerate that without complications. There's a difference that I need to mention between repair and replacement because the replacement technologies, they all will require a, um, a, a blood thinner and anticoagulation for at least six months and ideally longer versus the repair uh, options do not require that. So there's an important distinction. So perhaps an older patient who is at higher risk of bleeding complications, if the anatomy is favorable for a repair, we would favor that option. So in summary, cardiac rehab is what we would recommend, medications that may include anticoagulation depending on the type of device that the patient received. And if they don't need anticoagulation, do they get antiplatelet therapy or dual antiplatelet therapy for any duration of time? Mm -hmm. Well, most of these patients, interestingly, will already be on uh, either an anticoagulation because they have already atrial fibrillation, either as a consequence of mitral regurgitation or causing mitral regurgitation, and many of them will already be on antiplatelet. But um, for repair options, they don't necessarily need to be an antiplatelet for replacement Following the surgical literature, we may, you know, for the for the six months, as I mentioned, anticoagulation and antiplatelet, and then after six months, ideally, um, just aspirin, you know, for forever if the patient can tolerate that. For those who are listening to you tell about the these procedures, which really are game changers for our patients, um, when should they 
send their patients to a structural interventionist for consideration. Um, what are the, whether it's either symptoms or testing or the type of patient, um, because I presume just like surgical repair for mitral regurgitation, there is a timing issue. That is true. Well, I would say anytime that the patient has high surgical risk, the patient would probably benefit from the heart team approach to see if they qualify for a treatment that is less invasive than surgery. So I think that would be the number one high risk. And within that category, automatically any patient who had a prior mitral repair or a prior mitral replacement will be in that category. So if someone already had a tissue valve and is no longer working or a repair is no longer working, I think they would benefit from this type of evaluation. And then uh, patients who have high surgical risk for other reasons, like mitral annulus calcification, which is a condition that we're seeing more and more lately, when there's massive calcium in the mitral annulus, the surgical risk is usually high because of the technical challenges that are, are related to the calcium, but also due to the comorbidities that are associated. So if a patient has severe mitral annulus calcification, they also would benefit from this type of evaluation. And then last, um, patients who have secondary mitral regurgitation due to heart failure, um, those patients don't necessarily need to, need to have high surgical risk. I think those patients deserve the heart team approach also with a heart fa uh, failure specialist involved. Um, those patients also would benefit from this type of comprehensive heart team evaluation for possible transcatheter repair or replacement. I'll ask you one last question. Uh, where do you see this field going in the next two to five years? Because it's it's really blown up. Um, it, it's been exciting for this cardiologist to watch, but what, what do you, with your crystal ball, what do you see? I'm trying to hide my excitement. <laughs> it, it, I'm super excited, of course. It's like Taver. When you look back, you know, Taver is you know, already 20 years of Taver. This year, um, we celebrated the 10th year of uh Valvin Mac, you know, the transeptal Valvin Mac. So it is very nice to look back and see how much TAVR has changed. Now, patients who have aortic stenosis, as you know, most of them can be treated with an overnight procedure that is completely percutaneous. And um, most of them are treated in a less invasive way. I think that with the continued work that we all are doing, uh, there's a high likelihood that that's where the field is going for all uh, remaining valvular pathologies, the, you know, both mitral as well as tricuspid uh, pathologies may be treated both with either transcatheter repair or replacement. And immediately in the two years, I think there may be approval, FDA approval for transcatheter mitral valve replacement, but also for tricuspid, as I mentioned. So I think the field of valvular disease and valvular interventions is going to change in the near future, hopefully similar to Tabard. And I think for those of us who don't do the procedures, this is really exciting. As I sit with patients and I no longer say, you know, at some point you're going to have a cardiac operation because we're seeing your valve degenerate or the progression of their uh, stenosis or dysfunction of a prosthetic valve. And I don't have to say that anymore. So that to me is very exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Guerrero. Um, this wraps up this week's episode of Interview with the Experts. I'd really like to thank Dr. Guerrero Myra for joining me today and discussing this important topic. Well, thank you, Dr. Hayes, for the opportunity. And I'm excited not only for us, but I'm mostly excited for our patients. Exactly. So we look forward to you joining us again next week for another interview with the experts. Be well.